can you sight in a rifle with just one shot? Well, not precisely, but you can get close. A far better plan of approach uses about nine or 10 shots. But even this plan requires a careful step-by-step -step process. Folks, here is how to sight in the easy way. I'm Joseph Von Benedict with the Backcountry Hunting Podcast, appearing here as a co-host on Ron Spomer Outdoors. Ron asked me to address the easy way of sighting in versus the hard way. Now, when I was a kid, a bunch of us would get together before the deer hunt opener and we'd go out and we'd shoot at gallon milk jugs filled with water. And if you hit a jug at around 100 yards or so, you're good to go, right? Or at least that was the case with most of my pals. I was a little more OCD about it than that. I started shooting competitively when I was 14 years old and I learned early on the importance of having a properly sighted in rifle, also known as a properly zeroed rifle, right? So if there's an easy way, there must be a hard way to sight in, right? So what is that hard way? Well, it's without organization. It's without an understanding of how to properly adjust your scope and with way too many bullets used up, right? If you go to the range with two boxes of shells and you uh, start spraying and praying and making large adjustments to your scope, you're probably going to come home that afternoon with two empty boxes of uh, what used to be brand new cartridges and a large amount of frustration in your rifle because it's not going to be zeroed the way you want it to be. doesn't have to be that hard. The easy way goes like this. You start with a big target at 100 yards. Now this is assuming that your rifle isn't sighted in at all. Let's say you've got a new scope, right? Or a brand new rifle and scope. And Maybe the gun shop employee uh, laser bore sighted your scope and said, here you go, that'll get you started. Or maybe you mounted the scope yourself and you don't have a bore sighter. I don't like laser bore sighters. I've worked in gun shops through college and they just don't work that precisely. A better way is to just look through the scope, get your rifle locked onto a target at 100 yards, look through the scope and adjust your turrets until the crosshairs are on the target. Generally, that'll put you pretty close, not close enough to hit a deer through the center of the vitals, but close enough to catch a bullet on a target about this size, right? But save yourself the trouble of chasing shots that aren't hitting on a target that size by starting with a great big backing. Now, if you don't mind spending the four or five bucks to get it, the best types of backing I've found are the three by three foot white square foam core pieces that you can get at any craft store. Hobby Lobby always has them, right? Take your target like this and stick it right in the center of that big target. That way you've got all kinds of room around it where if you're hitting way off target, you're still gonna probably catch those impacts and you'll be able to make your adjustments, right? The next step to properly sighting in your rifle is to achieve a good shooting position with a rock steady rest. So if you have a shooting bench, make sure you're using a good sandbag up front or a bipod back up front and then underneath the back of the stock, another smaller sandbag. If you don't have a shooting rest, find somewhere you can shoot prone, again with a good bipod or sandbag under the front of your rifle and a small sandbag under the toe of your rifle. You need to get that rifle just as steadily as, as steady as humanly possible just to eliminate uh, the human errors, right? None of us are perfect. And as if you can get that rifle locked down as um, stably as possible, you will be able to make uh, cleaner trigger squeezes and more consistent shots. Now, on a side note, I'm gonna go off on a tangent and just say something. I don't like lead sled type of rests. Why? Well, they're actually hard on rifle stocks because it forces a rifle stock to take all the compression of that recoil that, uh, you know, especially a heavy recoiling rifle, and the barreled action is driving rearward into that stock. It can be hard on your stock. More crucial to the point of this discussion is that because it uh, lead sled or similar type rest where you really lock your rifle in, is so heavy, it prevents your rifle from recoiling with natural dynamics and it will change your point of impact. I've proved this over and over again. The lighter and the heavier recoiling your cartridge is, 
uh, the lighter the rifle, the heavier kicking the cartridge is, the more uh, negative effect, or the more change, I should say, that the lead sled will apply. Folks, just don't use them. I don't think they're necessary uh, for good shooting, okay? That's my two cents. So once you've achieved that perfect position, your crosshairs are just dead st steady, fire three shots at the center of your target, okay? Now I've kind of pre-drawn a few little dots on here representing the possible point of impact. You could be anywhere on here, right? But let's say you hit a little low and a little to the left. Now the great beauty of a target like this is that it has one inch grids on it. And if you place your target at 100 yards, you can pretty well figure that each inch can represent uh, a minute of angle on your scope. Most modern scopes have clicks, at least those made here in America for your typical American hunter. Clicks represented in quarter minute clicks or one minute of angle with four clicks between, right? Now that can be thought of in practical terms as inches. A quarter minute is almost exactly the same as a quarter inch. For those uh, technical minded among our listeners and viewers, uh, just to state for the record, a minute of angle at 100 yards is 1.47 inches, right? So it's fractionally larger than a one true inch, but for practical purposes and sighting in your rifle out, you know, for shooting into hunt, traditional hunting distances, a minute of angle is an inch, and let's just run with that for now, folks. So if you measure your point of impact down and to the left of center here, you can come one, two, oh, about two and a half inches low. And from center here, it's one, not quite two inches. Let's call it one and three quarter inches to the left. Knowing that, you can take the caps off your turrets if you have cap turrets, or just go to your standard dial-up turrets, and you can come up. Let's calculate it out. You got two and a half inches, divide that into quarters. You got 10 clicks that you'll bring your scope up. If you want to put your point of impact dead center at 100 yard zero, right? Then you're going to bring it one and three quarter inches left. That's seven clicks. Do the math, right? And you'll fire another three shot group. Okay, now assuming you get everything perfect and and that's not easy, right? Let's say you have a very accurate rifle with ammunition it really likes and your scope is absolutely perfect and tracking perfect. The you as the shooter are executing every shot, every shot, excuse me, with perfection. You should put those shots right in the middle, right? Now, most of us aren't perfect. I know I'm not, I'm human. And so maybe I got my calculation a little bit wrong. Maybe my position wasn't absolutely consistent. Maybe just something was a little bit different. Anyway, your, your next group isn't quite perfect, but it's darn near, right? All you have to do at this point is make one or two clicks down, one or two clicks left. This is just a, a, a representation of where your next three shots may have landed, right? And then you should be good to go, okay? I still like to fire three more shots just to confirm. I'm a large sample size kind of guy, and I like knowing. So I kind of call this uh, this approach the nine shot program. And then I throw in an extra shot there again because of that human factor, right? I'm likely to need a mulligan. Sometimes you fire a shot and it just didn't feel right. You think, hmm. you look through your spotting scope and you're like, yeah, that one's out. I bet that was me. And you can't say why, but you're pretty sure it was you. It's okay to call in a mulligan, fire another shot. Sometimes you're like, oh, I flinched. I know that one's out before you even look, right? You're going to need that mulligan, and you may need more than one. But generally, nine or ten shots will get you there, and you'll be able to confirm, tear a, you know, a nice ragged hole through the center of that orange diamond. If everything is going perfectly, you're good to go with 100 yards zero. Now, before we move into what to do next, I'm going to say I don't like 100 yard zeros. Now, if you're a if you live in the east or a thickly wooded uh, country somewhere and you just never shoot at game past 100 yards, then yeah, 100 yard zero is where it's at for you. That is the best choice. If you live in open country, like I do here in the west, and you frequently shoot longer, 100 yard zero is, well, I like to say it's a waste of a perfectly good flat trajectory out of a modern high-powered cartridge. If you'll sight that rifle in at 200 yards, 
You can then hold dead on out to 250 or so before you even need to start worrying about dialing up or holding over to compensate for trajectory at distance. And here's how that works. Even if you only have a 100 yard range, use a good ballistic calculator, put in your bullet's velocity, the bullet type, diameter, and so forth, your scope height above your bore, and calculate uh, your drops using the 200 yard zero. You can then back that up and also see where your bullet's impacting at 100 yards. With most modern cartridges, you're gonna be somewhere between an inch and a half and two inches high at 100 to put bullets dead on at 200. That's nothing in the field. You still just aim center of the vitals and go, right? You might hit that high above your aiming point at 100 yards. That's plenty close enough, right? And then you're gonna hit, oh, two to four or five inches low at 250 yards. Uh, you can just aim at the center and go still. And it really, really works well. For open country hunters, a 200 yard zero is your friend. So if you don't have that 200 yard sight in range, just calculate where you want your bullets to hit and then add that to the original come up. So you got two and a half inches here. Let's say you wanna hit an inch and a half high. You're gonna come up four inches divided by four. That's 16 clicks. You're gonna come up, come your seven clicks to the right, fire another group. It should land somewhere up here. Then if you need to, fire your third group just to refine, make sure you're exactly where you wanna be and you're good to go. Uh, it's worth noting that with most rifles, you should let your barrels cool between your three shot groups. Also, why shoot three shot groups? Why not just shoot one? Well, because rifles aren't perfect. Unless you're shooting a rifle that reliably shoots sub half inch groups and you as a shooter can lay down and fire a cold bore shot that's perfect every time, there aren't very many shooters in the world that can combine all those factors, right? Your shot won't be exactly the same as every you know, consecutive shot. So if you shoot a three shot group, you can average that center and make your adjustment from there. Let's say if you were just to fire this one, you'd say, all right, well, I need to come up two inches and right two and a half. And you'd be wrong, right? But if you average it, you come up, you're probably going to be correct. You may still be a little bit off like this group represents. Again, that's just the human factor creeping in. That's why we fire another shot, uh, sorry, another three shot group to confirm and uh, give ourselves the confidence moving forward that we have our rifle properly set up. Now there's one other thing we should talk about before closing this out, and that is follow-up steps if you want to shoot long. Okay, now whether you consider 300 yards long or 500 yards long, these steps are important. Okay, so first, Use a ballistic calculator to create that drop chart. With that in hand, go and actually shoot. Now this is called trajectory validation, okay? And shooters, competitive shooters, PRS shooters, NRL hunter competitors, and so forth, even just Western guys that regularly shoot at long distance, do this all the time. And they will validate trajectory out to extreme ranges, a thousand yards and beyond crucial stuff because almost no rifle and bullet and ballistic projection, that prediction actually lines up with reality. So shoot, shoot your rifle at those extended distances and then make necessary corrections in your ballistic app to bring reality and that um, computer generated estimation together, okay? Now, what do you do if you don't have a good long distance range near you. You're gonna have to travel. Make a weekend or a Saturday afternoon thing of it with buddies. Go Saturday morning, it's better. That way you can shoot while it's cool and the wind is down and then get home in time to take your wife for a picnic in the afternoon, right? Or your husband, for those of you ladies who are passionate shooters. So the important thing here is to not shoot at game further than you've shot at targets. This is a very, um, ethical based um, step that it behooves any hunter to take, right? Now, once you've done that, you kind of have to do one of two things. If you don't have a dial-up turret, you have to memorize your, your drops. So if, if you know that you're zeroed at 200 yards, say, and you're dropping about seven inches at 300 and 22 inches at 400 yards, you have to memorize those and then 
plug that into your brain, how high to hold to shoot at those distances. You're far better off to get one of the very readily available dial-up turret scopes these days. Ideally something with a zero lock. Don't uh, set yourself up for failure by using a, a turret that will spin freely either direction. You need to be able to, to sight in at 200, reset your zero stop to 200 yards. That way you can only dial up and when you've taken your long shot, you dial straight back down to that hard stop and you know you're on at 200 yards. Okay, use a turret rather than memorizing drops if you're gonna shoot past 300 yards. That's my best advice. Next, order a custom turret that's engraved for those yards. So all you have to do is range your target, dial your scope, and fire. This really helps when you've just seen the biggest buck of your life and the puppy in the back of your brain starts driving, right? Simplicity is a big deal at the moment of truth. So the other option you can do if you don't want to order a custom turret uh, or don't have time to, use a silver metallic Sharpie permanent marker. You can use your trajectory chart, right? You can dial up to 300 yards, put a little line on your turret, write the number three. Dial to 400 yards, referencing the number of necessary clicks on your calculator, put a little hash mark and the number four and so forth. If you want to, you can go to five and 600 yards. Now, this is the fastest method you can use for shooting inside traditional hunting distances. Probably not accurate enough if you're gonna try a shot at a thousand yards. So you'll need at that point to plug in current atmospherics, temperature, and so forth, angle, all those different things. But for shooting out to that 400 yard mark, this works really well, it's fast and reliable. And finally, you gotta practice from field positions, but that is a topic for another time, folks, for now. Suffice it to say that here is where Ron's favorite saying, hunt honest and shoot straight, really comes into play. I'm Joseph Von Benedict, and I'll see you in the backcountry.